Well, welcome in the precious name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, <clears throat> we are continuing in a new season of A Cloud of Witnesses and the Secret Place. And in this episode, I'm be sharing insight from E.M. Bounds. He was an attorney that lived in the 19th century, and he had an incredible understanding of prayer and the need of getting into the secret place and having this intimacy of fellowship, relationship with the living God, and how out of this, everything was to come forth. And I pray that this message really helps you better understand real prayer, the importance of prayer, the impact of prayer, because we have been trained religiously, and we see prayer as a system of repeating this prayer that we've you know, being taught, you know, this is the prayer list, we pray this, or we pray the Our Father, and we end up doing it as an automatic thing, and not a relationship, not an intimacy and fellowship, which is what we need. Because out of living prayer that has this connecting with the living God, it imparts to us everything we need. It brings us to the place where we walk in His will. It gives us the guidance so that we have the wisdom, discernment, knowledge, and understanding. It brings and produces on the earth His will into our lives. So prayer is critical. Now, I'm also going to be focusing on, on ministry, not just as Ian Bounds was, the, those called to ministry, because I believe that each person as a believer is called to ministry, not just the preachers. So that when we lay hold of our role to be a minister on this earth to the living God, then we have to understand that I cannot minister correctly without first connecting and laying hold of the living God in the secret place of His presence. So I just pray, Father, this message I would deliver accurately, that it would minister to each person, lift them, Father, and draw them into this deeper more intimate fellowship with you. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Breathe in us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Soften us and let that condemnation go. Let that critical spirit go. And let us, Father, walk opened to your spirit, receiving from your word, building our lives upon the revealed word. Thank you, Father God, that Jesus will be magnified, glorified. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. So, in Colossians chapter 3, let me just grab my notes here. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. We, as a believer, are to so walk differently. This world operates in a mindset of survival. It is always focused, looking to see how can I gain the advantage. It is not concerned about walking over, lying, deceiving. It is all about how can I survive, take care of me. But we as believers are to be looking and focused on Him in a life no longer living to survive, but living. And that's the difference. See, since the fall, man has abided in death, trying to survive. But through Jesus, we live and abide in life. And we enter to the place where we live the abundant life. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Who has saved us, talking about Jesus, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose, and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. And so I want you to lay hold of the fact that you and I have been given a call. That may be very different, but God has a purpose and place and plan for your life. And we are called to come into the secret place, to seek His face, wait on Him, so that we stay always in that perfect place, operating, moving forward correctly. See, it almost sounds contradictory, the call to wait and the call at the same time to go forward. But you can't go forward in that constant moving forward unless you're in a constant waiting on the Lord, and a constant listening, and a constant eyes attuned, focused on Him, 
We're not talking about a tearing and waiting like the disciples had to till the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit has come. And so we can move forward. But in our daily lives, we critically need this secret place relationship that goes deeper and further than just our prayer closet. And that's necessary. But we have to continue to stay in that place 24-7. We've got to continuously stay in the place understanding how to pray always with all kinds of prayer because of the relationship, the position it puts us in and how it impacts our lives. Ian Bounds, as I explained, was a, an attorney in the 19th century who became very famous for his books on prayer and they have great insight and that's why I want to share some with you today. He said, prayer with its manifold and many-sided forces helps the mouth utter the truth in its fullness and freedom. How many of us, because of what we've come out of our mouths, have done so much damage in our lives, in our relationships? Have we hindered our uh, opportunities? Have we stopped and blocked? You know, when you step back, if you ever watch, like for example, reality TV or something like that, and you see somebody, and you see how what comes out of their mouths, how they're so critical, condemning, etc. But they don't see it. And you, if you step back and by the Spirit, you can see the heart, and you see that they genuinely want to be a good person, but they don't realize what's coming out of their mouth and the damage that it's doing. I've seen how in my life this tongue has, you know, uh, failed me so many times, caused so many problems. And we're told in the book of James the difficulty with this tongue and the only way it can be disciplined, brought into the place of obedience is through prayer, through this fellowship with the living God, where our eyes are not focused on the earthly anymore, but they remain focused on the things above. Ian Bounds, well, let me say this. For many, your prayer life is simply what you say before you go to bed, what you say over your food. And it's not this fellowship that the living God calls us to. Remember, prayer was created by the living God. It's not something that man made. But we have now taken it and we've created the rules by which it works. But we need to is go back to the one who authored it and say, teach me to pray. We were given an example. Jesus said, pray in this manner, and he gave the, our Father as an example. It's a powerful prayer, but it's also meant to teach us. And as you look at it, you see the call to this fellowship, this intimacy that's built out of a holy fear and reverence of the Father. We are to look to him. We are to come to him, recognizing our need of him, that we, our lives must be built upon him. We can't face this day until we first have connected in prayer with him. And uh, Ian Bound said this, the preacher is to be prayed for. The preacher is to be made by prayer. The preacher's mouth is to be prayed for. His mouth is to be opened and filled by prayer. Now think about this because it doesn't, not just the preacher, and I think this is a good place to start, because many people, many preachers um, are taught how to carefully craft a message. And it can be a very good theological message. But it is not birthed and forged in the fire of the secret place of His presence. It doesn't come from the lips of the Father. Because I look at Jesus, and Jesus, of course, is our role model. We see um, where He explained that what He says he sees the Father speaking. He didn't speak his own words, but that which he heard the Father speak. Now that is something we have not even truly got a concept of or laid hold of. And this is where waiting comes. In Psalm 119 verse 114, I wait for your word. How many of us, you know, just simply rush forward with an assumption of the message that we feel the people need and have not, like Jesus, got aside, made a custom to get into the presence of the living God every single day and get a hold of from the Father, what do you have for your people? Now, let's turn this a little bit. What about in your family? 
What about if I could get before the Lord and get what's the message you have for my family? What is the message you have in my work so that what comes out of my work mouth carries the wisdom, the discernment, the knowledge, understanding that comes from the Father, drips of Him and has a life to it. And so that we are not building upon ourselves, but upon Him. Bounds went on to say, how many manifold, inimitable, valuable, and helpful prayer is to be in the preacher in so many ways, at so many points, in every way. One great value is it helps his heart. And prayer is a powerful tool to do and allow the Spirit of the living God to work on the heart. Because it's where the heart, sorry, let me explain it this way. Look at the parable of the sower. And it's all about the quality of the soil that determines the impact the word has. Good soil receives the word and the word produces it in our life. We can turn up and hear a good word, but the word doesn't have the full impact because of the soil of our heart. Whether it's filled with cares, wrong thinking, the lust, it can be all kinds of things. Look at the parable of the sower. We address and deal with that by getting our eyes fixed on things above through prayer and opening ourselves up and allowing the Spirit of God that opportunity and time to do work in us. See, I cannot run effectively the race set before me without me connecting with Him, looking to Him, presenting myself to Him, and allowing Him to do what He needs to do in me so that what comes out of me, like Jesus, glorifies the Father. We are meant to be those that point to Jesus. Our lives are meant to be witnesses. Witnesses of what? Of Jesus. So that what we say and what we do and what we think magnifies, reveals Jesus. Remember Jesus, after the Last Supper, explained to His disciples that I have glorified the Father and will continue so that in everything that He did, everything He said, everything He thought, that perfect life that He lived, in every aspect, it was revealing, glorifying the Father. He explained to the disciples that if you see me, you see the Father. Now, how many of us can truthfully say, when you see me, you see Jesus? You see a degree of Jesus, but are we striving and saying, God, I recognize I fall short in this area, and I look at how I've misrepresented you at times, or I've given a tainted image, and we need to so seek Him and so pursue Him so that we more accurately reveal Him, so that in our lives we are a witness to Jesus. Bound said, praying makes the preacher a heart preacher. Let me explain that again. Praying makes the preacher a heart preacher. And I like to stop there because that is what God's desire that it's about the heart, and that's where the secret place comes in. We enter into the secret place of His presence, of His heart, but He's desiring that we surrender the secret place of our hearts, that which is most precious to us, that which we hold and hide from others, that which is the real us, that I don't want to present and show others. We come into the secret place and we expose it and show it. You know, you look at Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they covered themselves and hid. And we have a tendency, we can put on a show in front of others and look good, but we don't want people to see the injuries, the damage, the hurts, the pains, and the other things, the wrong thinking, the wrong desires, the lust, all that that is hidden in the secret place of our heart. But as we come every day, and commit to the time to seek Him, to spend time and wait and allow Him to pour in us, and just pray in real intimacy, fellowship praying. Prayer that opens up and cries out like Jesus did, enables Him to do such a mighty work. We now become people, believers, living it out from the heart. Our secret place is revealed that He is enthroned there, that He is the one who is all in all in our lives so that we are real Christians, not just simply doing deeds, but we are real from the heart. Going back, praying makes the preacher a heart preacher. 
Prayer puts the preacher's heart into the preacher's sermon. Prayer puts the preacher's sermon into the preacher's heart. So it brings things into correct order so that I'm no longer preaching a message that comes from the head, that may be well studied and skillfully presented, but rather it is a message that comes from the Father's heart through the vessel of this heart to yours. And it brings the touch from the Father because I, me, there's no good thing that dwells in me. There's nothing that I bring to the table except a yielded vessel. And as I present myself in the secret place of His presence through prayer, He comes and imparts that message. And He speaks through this vessel that message that reveals His heart because He's got my heart. Bound said, the heart makes the preacher. Men of great hearts are great preachers. And I would dare say, we're talking about the secret place when Jesus is fully enthroned there and the life and the message manifest that, demonstrate that. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We drip with the life, the essence of what's capturing the secret place. You can see many people, they preach messages and you can see the taint. You can see the twist in it based on what's captured their heart, what has injured their heart. That is why it's essential that we allow God to do a mighty work by surrendering in the secret place, giving Him access to hear and saying, work in me until you are fully enthroned, until you occupy every part of it, every, every you know, valley, every portion of this heart, so that what comes out in the abundance glorifies you. That my lip, my life, my thoughts glorify because they're the outflow of what's in the secret place. You can see often a preacher can get up and deliver this great message. But see, that's not the full message. The message is the presentation that we give 24-7. What we do when no one's looking. What we do when we're in our private life, when we're in the store driving the car and others see it. And people see the bad example and then they look at the message delivered on Sunday or whatever day and it doesn't have the impact anymore because they recognize it's false, it's phony. And it's the same thing in our other areas of our life. So we lay hold of this, that the call to be the minister in the family, to be the minister in our relationship, where we're laying hold of the message the Father has that brings life to our relationships, life to our families. It's got to be real, forged in the fire of His presence as we wait on Him, seeking His face, allowing Him to do a work in us. See, we are always, they need to change, and God says, you need to change. And the only way you can change is coming and giving me the time, presenting yourselves through that prayer life, real prayer of fellowship, real prayer of dependency, real prayer where we come in faith, crying out, clinging, and recognizing that He and He alone can transform us. <clears throat> in Matthew 24, verses 45 and 46, Who then is faithful and a sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom the master finds so doing when he comes. We're at the final hour. And we are called to occupy till he comes. To be faithful in doing what he's called us to do in every aspect of our lives. Family, home, work, ministry. Every aspect. Be found faithful, serving him, being a witness to him. Ian Bounds says, the hireling and the stranger may help the sheep at some points, but it is the good shepherd with the good shepherd's heart who will bless the sheep and answer the full measure of the shepherd's place. We cannot be truly effective in just delivering out of the abundance of my great wisdom, of my great experience. Well, I've been through that, let me tell you. And so we minister from the area of the emotions and the soul where we are the ones. And we see what comes out of that is more death because when we sow to the flesh, out of the flesh comes death and destruction. But if we will sow in the spirit in this place of weakness, recognize, listen, I don't have, 
I may think I have, and for a long time I thought I did have, but when I recognize that without Him, and without Him putting into me the message He has, I am nothing. Jesus is that example, where as I said, He said, not my words, but what He saw the Father say. Now think who Jesus was. He was the living God. He was the Lord God who created all things, knew all things, yet He walked as a human vessel, so completely surrendered that He became dependent upon hearing what the Father had to say, demonstrating the perfect example to us that the only way that we can be a blessing, the only way that we can impart is to come and truly pay the price of surrendering our time and seeking His face and having a 24-7 relationship with the living God through prayer. Bound says, we have emphasized sermon pre preparation until we have lost sight of the important thing to prepare the heart. And how many of us, you know, in ministry, we have been carefully taught how to perfectly produce the right message, to study and show ourselves approved. But what we have not been taught is how to get in and go after and seek His face. We're so focused on the necessary to go, but you cannot go forth without first waiting. And they are meant to go hand in hand, so that I'm constantly, as I said, going forth in a constant state of waiting. The only message I can deliver. I love the fact that Jesus at times would stay silent. The pressure is on to give a word to say something, but he waited, stayed silent until the Father spoke by the Spirit to him. And he said to us, not to be afraid or prepare what we're to say, but we open our mouths and allow him to speak through us the right word in season. But he can only do that if we commit and give him the time and the place by waiting on him 24 seven and by always going forth in him. I pray you understand that. A prepared heart, Bond said, is much better than a prepared sermon. When we come and we have taken the time in His presence, then the words that come forth from us have a life. Whether that's me preaching on a platform, or where we're in our families, or in our relationship, or in our work, the words that come forth have life to them. They said of Jesus, no one spoke like he spoke. And in fact, they'd come to arrest him, but they couldn't because of the words, the life, the touch that was in it, that came and convicted, stopped and hindered. What a thought that if our words were so filled with him, so filled with that life, that it brought that immediate conviction, that immediate touch, that immediate healing. We see that Jesus with one word healed the people. What a thought. And that was the example that he gave for us to follow. But that example also shows that it was built upon the custom of a life committed to 24 seven prayer with the Father, always giving himself wholly to the Father. In fact, he couldn't face the cross until he had gone through Gethsemane. Bounds and volumes have been written, laying down the mechanics and taste of sermon making until we become possessed with the idea that this scaffolding is the building. That how we preach, and I can go buy messages. I can go get a carefully crafted sermon where the words are so carefully massaged so that they deliver this perfect message. I remember studying marketing, and in marketing, how you get this correct word, and that everything uh, focuses, delivers, correlates, and supports that one message. And so you carefully craft everything from the colors to the images, everything supports one thing, the message. And because we want to get mind share, we want to make sure that that message has the impact. But see, that's the natural man. Paul Torrance said he came in trembling and weakness. I mean, think about that. The great theologian Paul coming and preaching with trembling and in weakness. But he came preaching not in a, skill, a scare, skillfully massaged message, but in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. In the demonstration, how can you go to that place? How can we come to where the Holy Spirit 
is able to speak through us and move through us. It's through this heart preparation. It's through this time committed to pray in the secret place of His presence. Paul wrote to his spiritual son Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handing, handling the word of truth. And of course, the 2 Timothy 2.15. And the focus is this accurately handling the word. But listen very carefully. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. And that goes deeper than just your knowledge of the word. That we look at Romans 12, 1, we are to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. So we have to come and recognize we work for Him. He's the master. We must present ourselves. And God, have, where am I at? You think about your natural boss. You present yourself. Oh, did I do the job well? What do I need to fix? What do I need to change? So we have this relationship with the living God, presenting ourselves to Him and saying, God, open this word, teach me. And He as the Father comes and begins to show us and lift us and say, correct this, put this and help us so that we become that vessel of honor that is a witness to Him. Bounds said this, it would not do to say that preachers study too much. Some of them do not study at all. Others do not study enough. Numbers do not study the right way to show themselves workmen approved of God. And that's what he was going after. That we come first in prayer so that as we study the Word, it's out of a fellowship with the living God. So I'm not just reading it religiously, mentally, seeking it based on my opinions and understanding, but rather as I present myself in the secret place, it's, Father, I want to hear from your lips. I want to hear what you have to say and allow the Holy Spirit to breathe on, speak through the Word. We know that the disciples had been trained, knew the Word. All their lives they were brought up in the Old Testament, knew the law, were studied it, understood it, had a heart for it, but they didn't have revelation of it. Because it, we're told that Jesus, after his resurrection, came and opened their eyes to see. And all of a sudden, they were able to put the dots together. All of a sudden, they were not walking and a knowing about, but a knowing of. And that comes in the secret place. And we find that the word has so much depth to it and breadth to it. So that when I come, it starts to be opened. And I see things that I never saw before. And I may read the same verse a thousand times, and each time it's fresh and new, and it has greater depth to it, because God always has more. God always has greater meaning and greater revelation. Bound says, but our lack, our great lack, is not in head culture, but in heart, heart culture. Not lack of knowledge, but lack of holiness is our sad and telling defect. Not that we know too much, but that we do not meditate on God and His Word and watch and fast and pray enough. And I'll say that last part. We do not meditate on God and His Word and watch and fast and pray enough. Watch after Him. Seek Him. I look at in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus turns up, says to His disciples, Can you not pray an hour that you do not enter in temptation? We have a mindset that I just pray, Father, keep me from temptation, and I'm good. Yet Jesus, our example, the Master, can you not pray an hour? Because in that praying an hour, it wasn't just keep me from, but there was a work done in the heart to strengthen us, to change our perception, to correct wrong thinking, and do a mighty work to lift us, so that when the temptation came, they would not have failed. Let me finish with this. The heart is the great hindrance to our preaching. Words pregnant with divine truth find in our hearts non-conductors. Arrested, they fall shorn and powerless. I believe that we need to learn the importance and the power of prayer, the impact it has on the heart. I look at 
those that are backslidden, those that are lost. And you cannot reach them by simply preaching the gospel. Because unless the hearts are prepared and soft, the word has no impact. Or it's short living. But we're told to ask for the rain. We're told to stand and intercede. Because through prayer, we impact, touch the very hearts of the people. So that their hearts are prepared so the word is able to be effective. Let's start thinking of the need in ourselves for our hearts to be changed so that the message we bring forth so that the words in every situation carry with the life and let's pray for those on the receiving end that their heart to be soft so what the father has to say would really minister to them let's walk in holy fear so that we are simply conduits yielded vessels laying hold of what the father's saying and allow it to be spoken through us not tainted or touched, not moved upon by our spin or our opinions, but something pure and holy through holy fear, recognizing that He is the Master, He is greater. And we have to simply come and seek His face and listen to what He's saying. I really pray that this message has ministered to you, helped you. And if it has, would you please like, share, and subscribe? And check out more in this series. May it really minister to you and help you, draw you into a deeper, intimate fellowship with the living God. It will change your life. It will transform it. And you will begin to be a hearer and doer of the word. I pray that this message has blessed you. And I would ask, would you consider joining our prayer partnership program? It costs you nothing. You simply just go to the website and sign up. I pray that God will stir upon hearts of the right people to become financial partners because we need those. But I know the most important thing is prayer partners. So we do things a little differently. We never ask, we never seek or play with people regarding giving. As a prayer partner, you receive our email newsletter, which is about twice a week, and get invited to our Zoom meetings where I share messages that I don't always put on YouTube. I thank you for watching, and I want you to know that we're praying for you and that we love you and appreciate you. And we declare that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, be glad in it, because of, through, and for Him. In the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, Amen. Thank you.